All right, good afternoon, everyone. So we're gonna start a new unit today that is sort of different in character from what we've done until now. Um, <clears throat> we'll learn a completely different way of approaching our um, classification regression algorithms. So just to start, um, <clears throat> let's imagine that we have a, a biased coin, so a coin that flips heads more or less often than tails. And um, let's say our objective is just to figure out which of the two sides of the coin, heads or tails, is more likely to show up. And although we don't know this, let's say that heads occurs 70% of the time and tails occurs 30% of the time. So if we get to flip the coin once, um, you know, and we, we use that outcome as is our guess for which side is heavier, we would be correct 70% of the time, right? If we can do this, um, let's say 11 times and take the majority vote between heads and tails, in that case, we would actually be correct 92% of the time. <clears throat> if we could do this 21 times and again, take the majority vote, we'd be correct 97% of the time. And if we could do this 31 times, we'd be correct 99% of the time. So it's sort of interesting to see how um, <clears throat> when you get to you know, combine over all these different outcomes, the prediction gets a lot more um, correct, precise. So <clears throat> the implications for, for us in studying classification is that we can make an analogy and let's say that we have 31 binary classifiers. Each of these classifiers can be pretty bad on its own. Let's say they... Um, they're correct 70% of the time, which is just a little bit more often than guessing, right? So, um, and we're gonna call those weak learners. <clears throat> well, if we just take a majority vote of them, of these 31 weak learners, um, we get a strong learner. And according to this analysis, at least in some cases, this strong learner will be accurate with 99% accuracy. So we started with these really bad, you know, 70% barely um, better than guessing, and we combined them together to get this really great uh, single prediction. So what's the catch here? What, what's the main assumption that we made in, in doing this? Yeah. Independent? That's right, yeah. We have assumed that they're all independent because like in, in the extreme case that they're all the same, whether I do it once or 31 times, there's no difference, right? So the main thing here that we're, we're leveraging is that these outcomes that we're averaging are statistically independent. <clears throat> so that's the key. If we want to try to do this kind of stuff with machine learning prediction or classification, um, where we have many of these like weak learners, um, <clears throat> we want to combine them into a strong learner, we're going to have to make sure somehow that they are diverse. They're, they're doing things differently and, and complement in a complementary way that we can put them together and make them work for us. And this putting together, this is called ensembling. We're gonna combine all these to get <clears throat> um, this one hopefully better prediction. So what we're gonna talk about today <clears throat> are just generic ways of ensembling different predictors together for regression for classification. Uh, that's how we're going to start. And so keep in mind that you can do this ensembling with any any technique. Like So you could do this with logistic regression. Like you could train a bunch of different logistic regression classifiers. As long as you train them in a way that they're different, you can ensemble them. These could be neural networks. These could be support vector machines. They could be mixtures of these things. You know, a logistic, logistic regression, an SVC, a neural network. You can combine them together and... Um, you know, in most cases, the performance improves. Maybe it doesn't improve a huge amount, but it should improve. And often when you look at the, the leaderboards of like, you know, the, the best performance that was ever attained on some data set, it's usually an ensemble of several things. That's, that's how you really get the best performance. <clears throat> okay, so, um, <clears throat> so just to kind of talk a little bit more about what we did on the previous page. Um, we, we suggested, just as an example, to take the majority vote 
of some hard decisions. So in, in the previous page, those, those hard decisions were like the coin flips. They were, you know, just heads or tails, um, binary outcomes. And it's really, you know, there's not too many. If, you just, if you're given binary outcomes, it's not clear that there's much else you could do besides just some sort of voting scheme. <clears throat> but as we know, there's a lot of uh, predictors out there, <coughs> even classifiers, they give us more than just a, a binary outcome. Like if we use logistic regression, we put the score through um, a sigmoid, we get a number between zero and one that we can think of as a probability. That would be a soft output. If we have a soft output, that's gonna work a little bit better for us. There's, there's more information there uh, for this ensembling. So the hard voting classifier just takes the majority vote of the hard decisions, whereas a soft voting classifier takes soft outputs. Um, <clears throat> generally speaking, these are going to be probability mass functions and um, averages them to get like a, an averaged PMF. And then over that average PMF, you choose the peak. That would be the most likely class. <clears throat> so those are a couple options. Both of them are implemented in this voting classifier in sklearn. And as we said, um, this is going to work better when these classifiers um, are sufficiently diverse. So we want them to be diverse. And there's basically two kind of main ways to make predictors diverse. <clears throat> and they can be used together or separately. The first way is to train um, using different data sets. Like, so let's say you have a bunch of these different predictors. You give each one different data. So now when you train them, they're all going to act differently. or you use actually different prediction models, so different structures. You know, so logistic regression here, SVM here, and so on. Using a common data set or a common prediction model. And of course, like I said, you can combine these. You can use both different data and different, um, <coughs> different prediction models. Um, there's actually two ways to do the different prediction models. Like I said, you could use different um, architectures and training schemes. But you could also do this just by, if you have many features, you could give um, these different models different subsets of features. So even if they were all logistic regression and you have many, many features, you could give the first logistic regression some subset of features, the second one some other subset of features, and so on. And then they're all going to behave differently. So um, different types of model or subsets of features. And everything we said here with classifiers works with regressors, too. So it's quite general. OK, any questions on this? Yeah. So that first option with the common prediction model with different data sets, is that much better than just combining the data sets into one for the same model? <coughs> um, it's a good question. I, I think that. <coughs> I think that in most cases it is, although it could depend on the model. So if the model is just like purely linear and, and you're averaging the outputs, then that would be the same as averaging the inputs, right? So there's probably going to be some special cases where you get absolutely no gain. But it's going to depend on exactly how you train it and the architecture. If there's nonlinearity, then it could be different. So yeah, good question. Though. OK, so, um, so we're going to talk first about the data diversity, which is um, <clears throat> this part. So for, for data diversity, um, this is just some terminology, but there's sort of two approaches. One is called pasting, and the other is called bagging, which is short for bootstrap aggregating. <coughs> pasting is the one you might think of. So let's say I have three predictors, and I have a data set. I just partition my data set, let's say, randomly into three chunks, and I give each predictor a chunk. So that would be, um, we, would, we would refer to that as um, drawing samples without replacement. So you have this you know, pool of n training samples. You pick a sample, give it, you know, let's say, randomly to one of these three predictors. And now it's not in the data set anymore. Now you pick another one, give that, and so on. And you keep picking until there's nothing left. So that would be without replacement. And after you've done that, each sample that 
in your original training data set was given to one predictor and only one predictor. Okay. So the other approach, bagging, <coughs> is kind of different. It's maybe a little bit more unfamiliar to us. It's drawing samples um, with replacement. <coughs> so in other words, um, we have our N training samples. You draw one at random, and you give it to the first predictor. Now, you draw again, and that first sample you drew, you didn't remove it. It's still there, so you could, the second time, you could actually pick the same sample. It could happen. You know, it's unlikely, but it could happen. You give that again to the first predictor. And so, um, <clears throat> you, you, know, you, you say, I'm going to pick, maybe if I have N training samples, I'll, I'll just pick N times, and I'll give that many to that first predictor. Now, that first predictor is going to have several duplicates, and it's going to have several training samples that it's never seen because all these times you picked, you just never picked that training sample. So this is, um, this is what bagging is. Um, bagging <clears throat> is a very famous approach in statistics um, and usually works better than pasting. So it's, it's more common. Okay. <clears throat> so again, uh, some details now. With bagging, like I said, usually draw n samples per predictor, where n is the total number of training samples. And you can show, when n is large, that uh, 1 over e, or about 37% of your samples, will go unused for that predictor. So, you know, out of 100 samples, about um, 37 of them won't be seen by predictor 1, some random subset. That also means that that predictor 1 will have 37 duplicates, because right? all those samples that are, were never seen were actually some other duplicate that it seen, saw more than once. Now, predictor two is going to have, again, roughly speaking, 37% of the samples unused, but it's going to be a different subset than the first one because I picked them randomly. So, so it's a different, it's, it's sort of a random way to give data to these different um, predictors. And one of the cool things is that for each predictor, you can use the samples that it did not see in the training set for cross-validation. So it's not like they're useless. <coughs> they're called out-of-bag samples. So they're, they can be used um, productively. Okay, so that's, um, that's bagging. And this is uh, implemented for in bagging classifier and bagging regressor. Um, yeah. Okay, any questions on this? Okay. Now, um, coming back to the other approach, random subsets of features. This is another way to add diversity. Um, if, if you only have two features, you can't do this, right? You don't have enough features really to... But if you have a whole bunch of features, then this is a good approach. And in terms of how you allocate features to predictors, it's the same way that we just discussed. You have two options. You can sample with replacement or without. So you can take like your, you know, 100 features and you can partition them in, in, into random subsets and give each subset to one predictor. Um, or you could use this uh, bagging approach where you draw features randomly. S each predictor will see only a subset of features. Um, if, if the number of features is large, then, you know, roughly 37% won't be seen by that predictor. <coughs> and so that's... Those are, those are two options. So bootstrap is, is what you call the option when you want to <coughs> sample them in that bagging way. Um, <clears throat> any questions on that? OK, so now combining the previous page and this one, if you use both random data and random features, that's called random patches. And if you use random features but full data, that's called random subspaces. It's just some terminology. So these things are also implemented in the bagging classifier, bagging regressor. And if you set max features less than D, where D is the total number of features in your data set, it will do some sort of feature randomization. And if you want that bootstrapping, you just set bootstrap features equals true. <coughs> so they just give you all these possibilities. OK. Um, any questions so far? All right. Um, okay, so now we're going to switch gears entirely. 
and talk about a new way to do prediction that is different from our neural networks and our linear methods that we've seen before and our kernel methods. <clears throat> so, um, and the discussion here applies um, directly to both regression and classification. You can handle either of them with these approaches here. <clears throat> um, similar to <coughs> similar to the you know earlier units, we'll assume these vectors x i are our feature vectors with uh, d dimensions, and we'll just assume we have scalar targets y i, and we'll consider them to be real numbers, but um, you know they could be like binary numbers; they could be categorical. Okay, so the main way that these approaches work is that they carve up the feature space into different regions. So down here, you see the case where if you have two features, you have a two-dimensional feature space. So we have x1 on that axis, x2 here. And here is a region um, defined by features where, <coughs> or let's say data samples where x1 is less than t1, x2 is less than t2, and that gives us this region here. And then you can see we have another region here and a third region here. In total, we have split this up into five regions. <clears throat> and the idea is that whenever a test sample lands in this region, no matter where it lands in that region, we're going to output a constant score. And that is illustrated here on the left. You can see um, for those two x2, this is the output that we're going to send out. And you can see like R1 is this region down here. And you can see this, the height is the, the output value. We're going to call that Z. For any training or test sample that falls in this region, you always output exactly that value. And over here, for all of those, you output a different value and so on. So it's kind of like, <coughs> almost like a lookup table. You, you take in a feature vector, you see, okay, which region does this fall into? You look up in a table, oh, if it's in that region, I output this value of z, and that's it. I'll put z l whenever x is in r l, and l is now denoting the region. So you have capital L regions. Um, <coughs> and so, you know, just to see maybe how you would set these values, these vertical values here. <clears throat> if it's regression, what you could do is, let's say that somehow you, you have these regions defined, and now you want to say what is the value in that region. I think that would be this one. Um, <clears throat> what you could do is you could look at all the training samples whose feature vector fell into this region, and now you look at those yi's, the corresponding training labels, and if it's regression, you just average all of them that fell in here, and you use that value um, as the height there. Or that's, that's for regression. For classification, which is categorical, it doesn't really make sense to average. You can't average categories, but what you could do is you could look for the most common category among all the training samples, the labels, training labels that fell into there. <coughs> we'll talk more about um, specifically how we, we design all these things and the regions um, in the, over the next few slides. But this is the main idea um, behind this method. So any questions on anything here? Is this making sense? So, okay. <coughs> so you might ask, well, why are these things called trees? What, what about this as a tree? So <coughs> the way that you tend to um, come up with these regions is by recursively partitioning the feature space essentially by thresholding um, a single feature. Each partition is a single feature. So let me show again with this example what I mean. So how did we get those regions? Well, <coughs> we start with, let's say we start with no regions, so we have this entire space. Then we look at um, feature x1, and we say, was the value of that feature less than t1 or greater? So here's t1 here. So if it's less than t1, I'm on this side. So as I go down 
this direction, that corresponds to there. On the other hand, if it's greater than t1, then I'm talking about this. So in this first stage of processing, I have essentially partitioned my feature space into two, um, two regions. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to split it up more. So if, I have, if I'm going down this path and I'm in this region, I'm going to do another split. In this case, it's going to be based on feature x2, threshold t2. So if, it's, if x2 is less than or equal to t2, then I'm going to choose, um, <clears throat> then I'm going to be in this region. So that would be R1. And there on the hand, if it's greater, then I'm going to be in this region, R2. So now we've kind of come up with those final regions. And so here, we stop splitting. That's just the decision we made. <coughs> so now, what if it was, what if x1 was greater than t1? So now I'm on the right side of this. Now I'm going to do another split, another partition of the feature space. into Is x1 less than or equal to t3? If so, I'm going to stop splitting. I'm going to be in that region. If not, I'm going to be over here, and I'm going to split based on whether x2 is less than or equal to t4 or not. So I'll get those two regions. Okay. And at some point, I have to decide when to stop this partitioning. And so here I stop partitioning after we had five different regions. And um, <clears throat> you know, so that's going to be a decision we have to make um, during training is, is when we actually stop. Okay, so, that, so the reason they're called trees is because of the way we are splitting this up. Um, because we're looking at one feature at a time, you can see that these boundaries are always going to be perpendicular to the feature axes. Right? You're never going to have boundaries or regions like this. It can, these, these boundaries can only be perpendicular to the axis or, or parallel. <coughs> so, and that is just a constraint that we make for implementation. Typically, you know, it may not be optimal, but it's, it's going to be good enough as long as we have enough regions and so on. <coughs> um, okay, any questions on the overall proce procedure? Okay. So <coughs> this thing here is called a decision tree. Um, <coughs> the root of the tree is over here, which is the full domain of your feature space. It's before you've done any splitting. And the leaves of the tree are here at the other side. And those leaves represent the final decision regions that we've decided on. All right. OK, so let's, um, let's talk about sort of a generic approach um, to how we're going to train these trees. And then we'll do an example. And they call this training procedure a top-down manner, essentially because um, the way that you, you train them is you, you decide on this split first. Once that is decided on, then you decide on another split following it. You decide on another split and so on. It's not like you jointly decide all this at the same time. You go step by step. You start at the top and you work your way down to the leaves. <clears throat> so <clears throat> let's say we start with the entire data set, these xy pairs, and we have n of them as usual. And we'll use capital S to denote the index set. This is just the indices of all our training samples, so it's the set of numbers from 1 to n. <clears throat> so when we consider this first split, that's what we're going to focus on, this first split, we are going to be splitting essentially our training indices into two subsets. Um, and those two subsets will be you know, essentially splitting our training data. We're just doing it by talking about the indices themselves. And our objective will be to make the labels after the split as similar as possible within those two subsets, uh, which we'll refer to as as homogeneous as possible. <coughs> so. For example, they're maximally similar if, when you look at a subset, you find that they're all identical. There's no way to get more similar than that. Right? Um, they're going to be very different 
if maybe they have a high variance, if you're talking about regression, or um, if you're talking about classification, if there's many, many categories represented. So we'll get into those details on the next slide. But, um, but the way we're going to decide on this split is, as we saw before, we are going to have to choose, first of all, which feature to look at. Second of all, what is the threshold we're going to choose? So we have to design sort of two things at every split. Which feature, which threshold? <clears throat> and these things we have to design jointly. So um, let's suppose that we're hypothesizing that we should split the jth feature. <coughs> and if that's an ordinal feature, and if our hypothesized threshold is called T, then subset 1 would be all the training indices for which the training samples Xij were less than or equal to T. So um, J, again, is going to be the feature we're looking at, and I is just indexing which training sample it is. So, you know, the Xi's less than or equal to T would give us S1, and the Xi's greater than T would give us S2. So that's what we could do with an ordinal feature because we can compare those features to a numerical threshold like T. On the other hand, if we have a categorical feature, we have to do something different. Um, in this case, we have to think about all the different ways we could come up with um, combinations of categories or permutations of categories. So <clears throat> actually combinations of categories. So for example, if I had four categories A, B, C, D, then one possible split would be, you know, take the features in categories A and C, put that in S1, and then take the features categories B and D, put that in S2. So this would be how you could do a split if you had a categorical feature. In either case, you have to jointly search over both the feature and the threshold, or if we're talking categorical, you know, the particular um, way you're going to split the, the, uh, the categories. <clears throat> um, homogeneity, there's different ways to define it. We'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, but once we've done this, so you say, okay, X1, let's consider all the different thresholds. The number of thresholds, even though the threshold is a real number, it's not like you have an infinite number of thresholds to consider. Because for that feature, um, I have, you know, at most n different values because I have n different training samples, right? So there's basically n places or maybe n plus 1 places I could put that threshold. Um, if I have two samples, putting the threshold here or here or here is all the same, right? I don't have to consider those separately. So, you know, if I had... Uh, two features, there's essentially, I could put the threshold here, or I could put it here, or I could put it here anywhere. So I have like three possibilities for where that threshold could be. So, you know, you have a finite number of features to consider and a finite number of thresholds to consider. So yes, this is, it's possibly expensive, but it is doable. Okay, so that's how we're going to split. We're going to basically start with our full data, figure out what's the first feature we're going to use to split, what is the value of the threshold we're going to use to split, and now I have split my data into these two pieces. Call them S1 and S2. Now I'm going to repeat everything. I'm going to say start with S1, um, or I can even rename this S and then do another split into S1 and S2 if you want to reuse the notation. So you're just repeating this procedure at every split in the tree. <clears throat> Is that making sense? That's the overall architecture. Split and then, which means partition, then take that partition, split it further, split each of those further and so on. Um, <clears throat> okay, so when do you stop? Okay, well one place, one time to stop is if all the labels in that subset are identical. There's no point to split anymore because you already essentially have kind of like a perfect prediction. 
Um, <clears throat> you might also stop before then. You might say the minimum number of samples I want in any leaf is, you know, 10. Once I get to 10, I'm never going to split further. Or you might say my tree can have a max depth of like two or four, whatever it is. And so you never, um, you never split, you know, more than a certain depth. Um, so those are all going to be design, design parameters. Okay, so let's do an example. <clears throat> so we have here an insurance problem. So the target thing we're trying to predict is whether this <clears throat> automobile driver is going to be a high-risk driver or a low-risk driver. And this is the data we have. We have six samples in our data set. <clears throat> we have two features, age, which is ordinal, and car type, which is categorical. And <clears throat> let's, um, let's kind of parse this a little bit easier. Let's write age um, in order, 17, 20, 23, 32, 43, 68, and let's write the class as high, 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 low, high, low. <clears throat> okay. So um, <clears throat> let's say I'm considering <coughs> how to split along the age feature. So again, my objective is to make, to, to have as much homogeneity after I do the split, as much similarity in terms of the labels in the two subsets. So you can see I ordered the ages um, from low to high. And so now the splits that I could make would be like, I could put a split there. Actually, no, I don't, I don't think we ever want zero things. In, uh, so basically it's like I could put the split here here, 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 or here. So I have five places where I could do the split. <clears throat> where do you think we should put it to make things most homogeneous after the split? So let me see, is uh, Sudarshan Chakravarti here? Yeah. Yeah. So I agree with that. So on one side, like this is perfectly homogeneous. And then this is almost perfect, right? There's just sort of one, one in there that's imperfect. So that's pretty good. If I do this split, I have a lot of inhomogeneity there. And I also have on this side inhomogeneity. And if I go here, the amount of randomness has sort of gone up on the right. So yeah, this seems to be like the best place to do the split. And, and in fact, so that's what's, doing, that's what's done here, splitting according to age. So if it's less than 27.5, so here you can see what they did is they just took the numerical average of those two numbers. They looked right in between 27.5. That's where they you know, put, put the threshold. So now if you go on this side, it's high risk. So all the samples now are high risk. There's no need to split that anymore because essentially it's saying like, According to this training data set, if you tell me the age is less than 27.5, I can perfectly predict the target that's going to be high risk. Okay. Now, if I go the other way, you can see I don't have a perfect prediction yet, so we got to do a bit more work. <coughs> so now, um, you can see I don't really, there's no good way to split this based on age to get a, a perfect prediction here. Um, but I could look at the car type. So if I look at those samples, we have a 32-year-old um, low, or sorry, 32-year-old um, with a truck, low risk. We have the 43-year-old sports car, high risk, 60-year-old family, low risk. So this is a categorical variable. So we can um, 
you know, we could put sports on one side and these on the other side, or we could put family on one side and these on the other side, or truck on one side, these on the other side, and so on. So, but if you look at the, the labels, you can see, well, if I split sports from the other two, then I get perfectly homogeneous uh, targets after the split. <coughs> so that's what we want to do. Split that based on sports car or not. If it's sports car, it's high risk. If it's not, it's low risk. And at this point, we have um, perfectly homogeneous labels in each one of these regions or bins or leaves. And so now there's no point to split any further. <coughs> Okay, so that's, that's just one example. Any questions on that? Is it sort of making sense how this is working? Okay, so the things we have to get a little bit more <clears throat> clear on is exactly how do we define this homogeneity. Here it was sort of you know, easy to do it um, loosely, but <clears throat> we can be more precise. So let's first talk about what we do if there's regression. <coughs> If regression is our task. So we want to maximize homogene homogeneity within the splits, or we can minimize in homogeneity within the splits. Um, so for in homogeneity, which is like how different are the samples, we could consider variance. That's a pretty natural thing to look at. So we could say, all right, when I split S into S1 and S2. What I could do to compute the variance is first step is to compute the empirical mean in each subset. So, um, <clears throat> so if I'm talking about, you know, L is, is now indexing over my different subsets, one or two, I can look at the samples I in subset one. This is the size of subset one. So here I'm just doing an empirical mean over that subset one. That gives me mu one. And then I repeat this for when L is two. I do the empirical mean over subset two. I get mu two. And now I can, using the empirical means, I can compute the empirical variance in each subset or the sample variance. So <clears throat> we would just take the samples um, in that subset, subtract the mean of that subset, and then look at the average squared deviation from that mean. <coughs> now I can compute you know, two variances, two means. Finally, I need a single number for inhomogeneity. I can't really deal with variance one, variance two. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to average the variances. But I'm going to average them according to how many samples are, uh, you know, what's the fraction of samples in subset one versus the fraction of samples in subset two. The larger the fraction, the more weight I put on that variance. And so I finally get this variance here. And I can now, for, um, <clears throat> you know, for, for different choices of feature, I have to go over all my features. And then I have to, for each feature, I have to consider all the different thresholds. And I redo these computations. And finally, for all features and all thresholds, I will say, OK, this is the very best way I can split my features at this point in the tree. And once I've done that split, then I move down the tree into one of those branches and I repeat the process. Okay, so that's how we could do this, one way to do this with regression. <clears throat> Is this making sense? Okay, yes. Um, so I would think you'd want to like, have some way of making the ones, like the split that splits it more 50-50, like kind of prioritize that just because it would need like less splits in total. Like if you go back to the other example. Yeah, so, so you're saying like, uh, we're, we'll, we'll talk about this in a moment, okay. but I think what you're saying is like if you can get a 50-50 split at every stage, mm -hmm. then the, the depth of the tree is minimized. Yeah. You, you will eventually in log base two <laughs> and stages, you'll get one sample in each region. Yeah. But it turns out that like what you what we really care about is not so much the number of stages, but like we're trying to do predictions. So we, we really want to isolate samples and say like if I follow this sequence of decisions, one feature at a time, I can tell you the value of the target. Yeah. Like it's 
you know, I, I, I can tell you with a very small variance, it's going to be this number. So I think that kind of, that's more what we want to do than, than minimize number of splits. <clears throat> but we'll, we'll come back to, to that point in a moment. <clears throat> okay, any other questions? Okay, so variance is just one, one possibility. Instead of variance, you could do like absolute error. Um, that's going to be a little bit more <clears throat> tolerant to, to outliers. So the point is that there's various things you could do. Um, it's just that you know, when you actually train it, you have to decide, this is my metric. This is how I'm going to do my, my training. Uh, we'll talk about a more sophisticated metric um, on Wednesday when we talk about XGBoost. OK, so that's regression. Um, <clears throat> what about classification? So let's consider k area classification. So we have k different labels. <clears throat> and in general, we'll say k is uh, greater than 2. So what would, be, um, what would be the situation where I have maximum homogeneity when I looked at a subset of, of target values? Um, let me see. So is Raymond Zhang here? Yeah. So... If I gave you a subset of target values and I said, what's the most similar they could be? So basically, they're all the same. Now let's say I have like targets A, B, C, and I gave you a subset of them and they're all B. You can't be any more homogenous than that. That's that's the most similar they can be. So how could I now express that in terms of a PMF, a probability mass function? If I said that this subset of samples was drawn randomly from some PMF, what would the value of the PMF, what would the PMF look like if they all came from category B? So PMF is a vector in this case of three numbers. Okay, so the so PMF, let's let's plot it. So most homogeneous um, be like A, B, C. So if they're all coming from class category B, the PMF would look like this. <coughs> So this says, like, if I'm drawing samples randomly, um, <clears throat> with probability 1, I draw them from uh, class B. With probability 0, I draw them from A or C. So that is the, that's, that's the PMF that describes the most homogeneous. Um, yeah, the most homogeneity is that PMF. So now let's go least least homogeneous. So what would let me see, is Maxwell's on here? Yeah. Okay. So what do you think would the, the other extreme, what would be the most the least homogeneous? Most random, so to speak. What's the property of a PMF? Can they all be one? If I have three of them? One third, exactly. So one third, this would be just in homogeneous. So, and of course, back over here, there's two other possibilities. I could have this here, or I could have the spike here. Each of those three are equally maximally homogeneous. <clears throat> okay, so, so that's sort of the language that we, we're going to talk about homogeneity. We're going to measure it through the PMF. 
In general, the PMF is going to be a vector of k numbers if I have k classes, and the numbers have to be positive or non-negative, and they have to sum to 1. Okay, so <coughs> one of the most popular measures for inhomogeneity is this thing called Gini impurity, and it uses this equation. And so here is this PMF we're talking about. And um, <clears throat> so L, as usual, L is going to be L is 1 or 2. It's subset 1 or subset 2. And K are the classes. So we have K ranging from 1 to capital K. And so this is the particular metric. So let's think about what this means. If I consider, what is, let's say, what is the value of this guy if we look at the most homogeneous case? So let's see. Well, Sri Tirumala Raju? Sri here? No. Okay. What about um, all right. Thomas Agre? Uh, John Engel, Ethan Pavan, Shreya Gundavarpu, okay, Colby Hirolal, Brett Hinkle, Aaron Hoskinson, um, Jacob Isaman. See Mitchell Leroy. Oh, actually, he dropped. Um, Vincent. I saw Vincent here. Vincent Lynn. There you are. Okay. So, um, so Vincent, what would this number be if we plugged in this case? So we're sorry. I didn't hear you. Sorry. Is this referring to the values given from your PMF? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the PMF. So as as we go over k, these are the values. K equals one, two, three. Yeah, that's right. Because when you square these numbers. They stay at 0 or 1, and there's exactly one of them that's not 0, right? And I sum up that one that's not 0 with the others that are zeros. This turns into 1, subtract this from 1, and this inhomogeneity metric is exactly 0. This is the smallest value that this thing can take, and this happens in this extreme case. <clears throat> what about the other case? This is the most inhomogeneous case, let's see how high can the genie impurity get. So let's see, is um, Akash Patel? Right. Yeah. Um, um, let's, let's do with general K. So oh. this, these values would be 1 over K. Oh. Right. And so what happens when I square 1 over K? And then I sum up k of them. Right. Each of these guys is 1 over k squared. OK, so each of these is 1 over k squared. But then I'm summing k of them, so I have 1 over k. So then the largest we can get is 1 minus 1 over k. Okay. So this is just a metric that shows where you're on the scale between those extremes, and it's based on you know, this particular thing of squaring the PMF values, summing them up, subtracting from one. Okay. But this is like pretty much the most popular metric for inhomogeneity. It's called Gini impurity. Okay, so zero means perfectly pure um, or you know constant targets. <clears throat> now there's many others. There's Entropy, misclassification error, chi-squared, and so on. Um, <clears throat> we're not going to get into it, but if you want to read more, you can look at this uh, textbook. 
<clears throat> okay, so we've seen homogeneity metrics for regression, for classification. Uh, what happens if we have a generic loss function? So this is more familiar to us because all semester we've been saying, like, you know, we use a maximum likelihood, or let's say um, negative log likelihood to determine a loss, then we'd say that's our objective to minimize it. So if, if we had that loss, how would I actually do this with the tree? <clears throat> so let's, let's uh, write the tree as F, and let's in particular write the tree as sort of two stages of operation. <clears throat> There's, um, the first stage is a decision function we'll call Q that assigns the input uh, feature vector x to a leaf in the tree, you know, so one of our decision regions. Second is we, once we know which region it's in, we assign the value zl as the output for, um, for that region. <clears throat> so similar to what we did here in this picture, like we first say give, given an x1, x2 pair, we figure out did it come into region 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and once you know the region, we said we can somehow design the height according you know, to that region. So that's like the values of, of z. So if we think about, if we write the tree that way, in terms of this two-step process, we can actually even squeeze it into one statement, z sub qx. So qx gives the subscript of z, and that is, tells us which of the entry in this z vector we, um, we pick. <clears throat> so if we approach things this way, minimizing this loss summed over our training samples, we can write it this way. So we have, um, we have a, a sum over the training samples for which that feature vector ended up in the elth leaf or region and then we know for all those feature vectors that landed in that region, we output exactly the same value, which is ZL. So that's what happens if we fall into region L, and then we just sum that over all the different regions. Okay, and that's just a way of writing this with this particular um, architecture. So the things we have to decide now are we have to decide <clears throat> this tree that you know, tells how we map inputs to regions, and then we have to decide on the values we put out once we're in a given leaf. <coughs> That's our z vector. Okay, and we're gonna do this um, one split at a time, top down. So imagine that we are at some point splitting S into S1 and S2. <coughs> so basically, before we do the split, um, we haven't done any splitting yet, so all the samples in S will be assigned the same output, we'll call it Z1. Okay, and so how you design Z1 is you just say, okay, let's look at all the samples in S, let's look at the loss um, between their respective targets and this Z1, which is what we're trying to design, and let's just do some search over Z1 to find what is the Z1 that minimizes that loss. So this is if we don't do any splitting, or let's say before we do a split. Now on the other hand, if we do a split, <clears throat> then depending on how we design Q, um, each sample I will either end up in S1 or in S2. If it ends up in S1, we have to design the Z1, the output for that branch of the tree, or if it ended up in S2, we have to design the Z2 for that branch of the tree. <clears throat> okay, so we have we have to, first of all, you know, decide how we're going to do this split, so which feature we're going to choose, which threshold, and now once we've hypothesized that, we can design the two Zs. And so that's what we have to do. Um, it sounds like a lot of work, but computers are pretty fast. They can do this pretty, pretty efficiently. <coughs> so we're going to try all the feature threshold pairs. Each one of those leads to a particular split, and then... Um, we design the, the Z for these splits. And finally, when we're all done, we evaluate the loss for each split and choose which is the best one. And in fact, at this point, you can say, all right, what is the loss before I split? What is the sum of the losses after I split? If you don't see that the loss 
if the loss hasn't decreased, it's not worth doing the split. So you can see right away this gives you a, a chance to say, is it worth splitting or just should I just be done? And should I stop here and never split this branch further? Okay. So that's, but you can see that there's, there is a procedure here. If I give you a generic loss, yes, there is a way you can d go down your tree in a top-down manner and design everything uh, you need according to that, minimizing that loss. So we could do this with binary cross entropy or whatever you want. Okay, so we're getting near the end. Um, let's just summarize advantages and disadvantages of decision trees. <clears throat> so first of all, if you've probably noticed, the, the, everything we've done is very general. We can talk about classification, we can talk about regression, we can use ordinal features, categorical features, mixtures of ordinal categorical within a data set. And if you think about categorical, they're kind of tough. Like if I give you a data set where there's many categorical, fe categorical features and each categorical feature has many categories, like how would you even approach that based on what we have learned so far in the course? Like if you think about one hot coding, that would be like an explosion of the number of different, you know, because when you one hot code, you kind of expand into all these possibilities. You would have this massive expansion. You would have a massive number of one hot coded features. It's not practical. Same thing for neural networks. So trees actually give us a way of handling many categorical features um, efficiently. <clears throat> you don't even need to standardize your features. This is because um, you know when we when we do our splitting. Let's say I have a, a, an ordinal feature. I'm just really looking for relative to all the other features, where am I? So if I shift all these features, it doesn't really change where I'm going to split. If I scale all the features, it doesn't really change where I'm going to split. So you don't even need to standardize your features for these methods. <clears throat> Second, this is a very interpretable uh, technique. Like you can see exactly how you came to a given decision. Um, this is very different than neural networks, where if you say, like, explain to me why you came up with this, this decision, it's just incredibly complicated black box. No idea. You know, you can, you can see that there's all these weights and stuff interacting, but it's like you can't explain it to anyone. You can explain this to someone. Um, in certain industries, you have to be able to explain it. Like, there's laws that say, <clears throat> like, if you're in the insurance industry, you need to explain why you came to a decision to uh, cover this person or not. Otherwise, they can sue you. And so you can't really use a neural network in that industry. But you could use decision trees because it's very explicit. Well, I decided on it because of this and this and this. That's, that's how I arrived at that decision. Um, the prediction is quite fast. So <clears throat> if you think, roughly speaking, how many different stages of tree processing do I need? Well, let's say, roughly speaking, that you have your training data set every time you split. Now, generally speaking, you're not going to exactly split it into two, but you know, um, let's just say for sake of argument that you do. That means after one split, you're going to have two subsets of n over 2 samples. After the second split, you're going to have four subsets of n over 4 samples. After the third subset, you're going to have eight, after four, uh, third split, eight subsets of, of n over 8, and so on, right? Once you go down log base 2 splits, you will only have one single element in each leaf of your tree. There's no way to split more. Okay, so that was if everything is balanced. So that's not what happens always. But here we have like a big O, which basically gives us some, some room to play. Um, <clears throat> because we're not, generally speaking, going to go down to the point where we have uh, <coughs> you know, one sample per leaf. But roughly speaking, this gives um, a description of, of how many splits you need. So. It grows logarithmically in the data set size. That's pretty good. Logarithmic growth, growth rate is very slow, so not too many splits, even as n gets really, really big. Now for the disadvantages. The training can be very expensive. If you consider every feature for every split, and you have a lot of features, so one trick is let's consider not everyone, but just a few randomly chosen features for each split. So now we're getting to kind of use these ensembling techniques. And it turns out these ensembling techniques are extremely well suited to trees. They're like the perfect match. It's just a way of simplifying. Um, you, can, you can say, I'm going to give, I'm only going to look at a subset of the data for this split. Or you can say, I'm going to look at a subset of the features, or both. 
and it, it's a perfect match. And so, and it just decreases the time it takes to train your tree. Uh, another issue with trees is they're prone to overfitting. So essentially, if you think about what we've done, we have gone through a tree that for our, tra- uh, it, it, if we don't stop early, after we've um, gotten to the leaves of our tree, we'll have perfect homogeneity in every leaf, meaning we have perfectly uh, predicted all our training data. Um, <clears throat> so that's, you know, good on one level that, that we can do that. It means this trees are powerful. On the other hand, it's bad because that's just overfitting. Um, if you just take out one training sample, it could be that your entire tree needs to be reconfigured just because of how the splits work. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's very um, low bias, but very high variance. Small changes in training data lead to big changes in the architecture and the per- performance. <coughs> so the way that you regularize with trees is typically you can add things to your, to your loss like, you know, like we did before, but more commonly you enforce minimum number of samples per, per leaf or max depth, and these have regularizing effects. They um, cause a tree to not change as much if you make small changes in your data set. And there's a great overview of these decision trees in the scikit-learn documentation. And the very last thing I'll say, it's, it's real quick, but it's sort of the, um, <clears throat> the culmination of this, is that decision trees, you know, they're very low bias, very high variance. Um, <clears throat> that's great. It, it's, it's, I mean, it's, if you have a single tree, it's very bad. But if I have a whole bunch of trees, I can use that variance to my advantage. I, I have now a diverse set of predictors. And these, um, these predictors can be ensemble so that you know, each, each one of them is pretty bad, but if I have a lot of them, um, averaging them can be quite good. And that is exactly the idea behind random forests, is you just train an ensemble of trees, usually very, very uh, crude trees, sometimes trees that just have like um, depth one, or you know, s- some, some very, very simple thing. Very, very simple, uh, either, yeah, very simple way of splitting. And then you, um, <clears throat> you average them together. So here's just a little illustration where we have trees. This would be for two-dimensional data. And you can see for each tree, we gave it a random subset of data. So it came up with some sort of strange um, decision regions. But when you average them all together, you get something that looks quite nice. <clears throat> okay, so this is just a, a little illustration, but, um, but that's the idea. So random forests are, are really nice. Um, you'll get a chance on your projects to play with them. There's a few tweaks and tuning parameters. Um, we'll get into those uh, on Wednesday. So that's it for today. Sorry I went a little bit over. See you guys on Wednesday.